Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Porterfield, President and CEO of the Aspen Institute. Welcome to our 37th annual awards program. We bring you this year's program as our world continues to grapple with a whole host of challenges. They are sizable, but solvable if we all work together. And that's precisely why the mission and work of the Aspen Institute and your support are so essential. We're a community of humanistic optimists, thinkers and doers working every day to make practical real world differences. It's been just over 70 years since our founding in Aspen, Colorado, against the backdrop of a world war that shook the very foundations of civilization. Our founders were a group of business, art, and academic leaders dedicated to the idea of human dignity. Today, the Aspen Institute has grown into a bold global nonprofit organization committed to promoting the free, just, and equitable societies in which human dignity can flourish. We do that by focusing on the power of inclusive, open-minded dialogue among people with diverse views and from all walks of life. We convene the leaders of today and tomorrow, giving them a brave space to discern their core values and callings and to recommit to public-minded actions. And we work to inspire new ideas and innovative solutions on issues like education, economic inclusion, the environment, social trust, global security, and the ending of discrimination in its many forms. These enduring methods of change making are exactly what's needed to make a productive difference for the one and the many in the short term and the long term. One of the most powerful tools that we have to serve our beautiful and fast changing but fragile world is the cultivation of values-based leadership. This work is a foundational calling of the Aspen Institute, and it's why we're so proud to bring you this awards program today. By elevating the extraordinary work of our two honorees, we seek to not only celebrate their contributions, but inspire others to hear and respond to the call of leadership. It's in this spirit of addressing some of today's greatest challenges, such as the pandemic, poverty, discrimination, that we are proud to present the Henry Crown Leadership Award to physician and geneticist, Dr. Francis S. Collins, and the Institute's Corporate Leadership Award to business pioneer, Ursula M. Burns. Both of these remarkable leaders have tackled these major issues with grit, grace, ingenuity, and above all, integrity. We honor Dr. Collins for his exceptional leadership of the National Institutes of Health, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic, and for the extraordinary medical breakthroughs discovered under his leadership at the Human Genome Project. We honor Ms. Burns, the first black woman to lead a Fortune 500 company for her trailblazing leadership during a time of tectonic shifts in and disruption to the way that businesses operate and CEOs lead. In this program, you'll have the opportunity to view two insightful conversations with our two honorees. Dr. Collins and Ms. Burns join a community of past honorees that includes Madeleine Albright, Brian Stevenson, Baklav Havel, and Condoleezza Rice. All have answered the call of service in ways that the Aspen Institute encourages and admires. Thank you for joining us and welcome to the program. Here to present the award to this year's honoree is Bill Mayer, Chairman of the Henry Crown Fellowship Board of Overseers and Chairman Emeritus of the Aspen Institute Board of Trustees. I'm here to present uh, Dr. Francis Collins with the Henry Crown Leadership Award. Dr. Collins, as you all know, is a recently retired head of the National Institute of Health. But Dr. Collins has been the head of the NIH since 2009, and before that was the second director of the Human Genome Project, taking over in 1993 from Dr. Francis Watson and saw to its conclusion of the mapping of the human genome in 2003. And I think what's remarkable about Dr. Collins and his leadership is that he has provided the leadership in a very smooth way. Most people don't realize there's another dimension to his life. He has a rock band, which he uh, still plays with. So this is a multi-dimensional individual. He's received numerous awards. And I think for the Henry Crown Award and what it stands for, which is an individual who has not only accomplished a lot, but has given service in a number of different ways publicly 
Dr. Collins certainly qualifies. He could have certainly taken many other career paths in his life and chose to spend his life in a service to his country. And we were very lucky to have him, in particular in the last two years through the whole COVID crisis. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Andrea Mitchell to have a conversation with uh, Dr. Collins. Andrea, all yours. Thank you, Bill Mayer. Thanks for the kind introduction and welcome Dr. Francis Collins. Congratulations on the Henry Crown Award for your leadership, for your lifetime of contributions, contributions still to come. Oh, thank you so much, Andrea. And I'm greatly honored by this award. I didn't know much about Henry Crown until I heard about this and took a time to uh, read a little bit about this remarkable person. So it's an honor indeed to have an award that's attached to his name. And thank you to Aspen. And thank you to you for taking time for this conversation. Well, it's my delight, my privilege to be with you tonight. And also to say that uh, no one could be more deserving of the Henry Crown Award than you. So uh, let's talk about the current situation and what we've been experiencing with this pandemic for almost two years now. And as we are heading into winter, uh, the colder months, and of course the greater, you know, greater danger, we have this new variant. And uh, as we've learned about it, uh, it has created a lot of fear in the community globally and really highlighted the disparities between vaccination levels around the world. What are your thoughts going into this about how we can better cope with future variants? Well, this has been an incredible experience uh, for the whole world. And certainly that's true here in the United States. And for me as the director of the NIH, it has this remarkable paradoxical feel to it, uh, challenged by this arrival uh, of SARS-CoV-2, which has now led to the worst pandemic in more than a century. The scientific community rose to that occasion in truly remarkable ways, uh, building on decades of basic science efforts to understand how cells do what they do and how the immune system works. It was possible to design these mRNA vaccines and to get them developed and tested in record time and approved uh, for uh, emergency use in 11 months, which is about five times faster than has ever happened before. Similarly, scientists at NIH working with colleagues in the private sector were able to speed up the process of testing various therapeutics. That's how monoclonal antibodies came along. So science uh, was called upon and basically rose to the challenge and people worked 24 seven, not worrying who was gonna get the credit to try to do what they could do to save lives. And I do think mRNA vaccines for other diseases that are not part of the current pandemic uh, will turn out to be a big advance tuberculosis, where we've been trying for a long time to come up with a vaccine, this might be a strategy that really would give a lot more chance of success. And mRNA vaccines for cancer are also uh, intensely of interest. We know the immune system is a really good ally in fighting off cancer, but sometimes you got to wake it up. And an mRNA vaccine that's designed specifically for that person's cancer would potentially make it possible to do something that up until now has just been too slow. So we'll see where that goes. It has all kinds of spinoffs. What excites you most about what you might be returning to? Uh, I know this is, you've been the longest serving director of three presidencies, and you're gonna be taking a step back now. So as we are heading into the, the new year, now already as we, as we speak tonight, uh, what excites you? What do you wanna work on, if you can say? Well, 2022 is going to be for me kind of a sabbatical. I've never had one in very many years working as a scientist running a research lab. I've been running my research lab at NIH for the last 28 years with remarkable trainees and senior scientists who have done amazing things and who've been a great anchor for me in the reality of what's possible at the bench and in the clinic. We have two big projects. One is sorting out in intimate detail, what are the molecular causes of type 2 diabetes, a very common disorder, and how could we use that information to come up with new treatments? And that has gotten into a really amazing space as far as the technical tools that we can use to unravel those mysteries. The other is a very rare disease that is the most dramatic form of premature aging called progeria, uh, one which only affects maybe 200 kids in the whole world right now, but is a heartbreaking condition to see. These kids age at about seven times the normal rate. 
and that their intellectual development is totally normal. And using the CRISPR approach, where you actually have the chance to edit very precisely a misspelling in the genome, we believe that within a year, we might be ready for a human clinical trial to see if we could not just help these kids, but actually fix the misspelling uh, by infusing them with an appropriate virus-driven CRISPR agent that could fix the problem. Now, that's bold. It's one of the reasons I'm really excited about going back in the lab. And one of the reasons I think the next few years for all of NIH research are going to be particularly exciting, because if it works for progeria, this could start working for those thousands of diseases where we know the DNA misspelling, but we don't currently have a treatment. And just on a personal level, uh, are you playing the guitar? Is there more music? Is there another rock band in your future? I miss my rock band because we haven't had any gigs for the last uh, year and nine months because it wasn't safe uh, to gather together. We did have one gig on a very cold night in somebody's backyard about a month ago, just in order to be able to get together. And uh, after, you know, the seventh or eighth song, I couldn't feel my fingers anymore because they were <laughs> no. frozen, but we still had a good time. Music is such a balm to the soul of most of us. It certainly is for me. And I enjoy music in a solo circumstance, uh, playing my guitar by myself or my piano by myself. But I enjoy it a lot more when it's a group event. And I'll be really glad when that get, becomes possible again. And have you had the time throughout this crisis to play your guitar or to play the piano? I have made the time because it's my mental health break. <laughs> if I'm having one of those days where everything seems to be going the wrong way and I'm really feeling like, whoa, what am I doing? And I'm frustrated. I'll just stop for 10 minutes and I'll go pick up either the guitar or sit at the piano. And I always feel better afterwards. It taps into a different part of my brain that gives me joy. Is there anything else you would recommend besides music? for the, the mental health aspects of this, especially for our children and you know, college kids who've missed a year, a critical year, missed the socialization of being on campus and are now hoping, praying that this new variant doesn't mean an interruption in their, in their education again. Yeah, three things. One is don't let your relationships uh, fade just because you can't be together face to face, whether that's with family or with friends. I actually have found this dismal time with COVID-19, a time where I am closer to my two daughters and my five grandkids than before because we Zoom all the time. And so I really know what's happening in their lives at a level that I didn't before. I miss hugging them, that's for sure, or, or sitting around together and having a, a change of, a sharing of stories. But I feel like that's been a really important investment Exercise, I think it's been so easy to turn into couch potatoes. Uh, my wife and I have a trainer uh, that has zooms into our basement and uh, twice a week, I get reduced to a total puddle, but it's a good thing. I feel better as a result. And then thirdly, and very important for me is spiritual connection. Uh, I get up at five in the morning and my first task is to get my head clear. And that usually means picking up the Bible and reading some verses and thinking about what they mean and trying to put into context all the stresses of the day that happened before and the one that's about to happen and, and understand that this is really part of a much bigger and more important picture than any of the little details that I'm struggling with right then. Uh, is there anything you will miss from your leadership role at NIH? I know you won't be far. Uh, I won't be far because I'll keep my lab going, which uh, I'm talking to you right now from uh, NIH campus, and it's an amazing place with amazing people. Um, I will miss some of the opportunities that you have as NIH director to identify an area of scientific opportunity that's just emerging. Hmm. And you can use the landscape view you have and the convening power you have to then bring a whole lot of smart people together and say, let's brainstorm about this. Let's see what we could do that might happen in 10 years, but maybe we could make it happen now. That's been part of the joy of this. That's how we came up with the brain initiative. That's how we were doing precision medicine and the all of us program. That's how with uh, opioids, we're having a big effort to develop treatments for chronic pain that aren't addictive. Those are the kinds of things that I've been able to shape this bringing together collaborative efforts across sectors, including lots of work with the private sector as well, as long as we're careful about conflicts of interest. So I'll miss that. That has been an opportunity that I never dreamed would happen to me. 
and I've greatly benefited from it. It's been a total privilege. Well, I know you are still going to be part of that, and I just wish you, um, you know, many years of guitar and piano and Bible study and working out with your trainer and family and grandchildren and public service or wonderful research. Thank you for all of your contributions and those still to come. And uh, I'm just so happy to be here to congratulate you on the Henry Crown Award. And on behalf of myself, and, and I, if I speak at all for Aspen and my connection to them, I know how honored we all are to be with you tonight. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Thank you so much, Andrea. It's been a privilege to speak with you. I love the NIH. I've loved my job. I'm going to try to figure out now what to do when I grow up. Well, don't, don't grow up. Never grow up, as they say. <laughs> Our program continues with the presentation of the Aspen Institute Corporate Leadership Award, presented to an individual whose leadership exemplifies dedication to the betterment of society. Here to present the award to this year's honoree is Jim Crown, Chairman of the Aspen Institute Board of Trustees. Hello, I'm Jim Crown, Chairman of the Board of the Aspen Institute, and thank you very much for joining us for this year's annual awards program. Each year, our annual award celebration provides us with the opportunity to honor exemplars of values-based leadership and those who have made significant contributions to improving society. I'm privileged to present Ursula Burns with the Aspen Institute's Corporate Leadership Award. Ursula has been a trailblazing role model and a singular innovator. And she has done this not only while her industry was undergoing dramatic transformation, but also during a time of profound shifts in how businesses operate and how CEOs lead. The Corporate Leadership Award honors an individual whose leadership and dedication to the betterment of society exemplify the values and traditions of the Aspen Institute. Ursula Burns has demonstrated these values through her vision and her courage to take new paths on behalf of communities, stakeholders, and employees alike. Unquestionably, Ursula has helped redefine the role of the private sector in the 21st century, and in doing so, she represents the highest standards of corporate citizenship. What is so exciting about her accomplishments is that they represent evidence that values-based leadership and a commitment to the public good can bring extraordinary changes to the benefit of all. As many of you might know her personal story, she is the daughter of a first-generation immigrant mother who worked her way through school, earning a master's degree in mechanical engineering from Columbia University. She started at the Xerox Corporation as a summer intern and eventually rose to become a transformational CEO. And as many of you know, she was the first black woman to lead a Fortune 500 company. On behalf of the Aspen Institute, it's an honor to present the Corporate Leadership Award to you, Ursula Burns, and thank you for being with us here for this event. And I now have the great pleasure of turning our program over to Ford Foundation president and longtime friend, Darren Walker, who will be interviewing our awardee. Thank you, Jim, so much for that lovely introduction of our honoree, Ursula Burns, who is receiving the 2021 Aspen Institute Corporate Leadership Award. Welcome, Ursula Burns, and congratulations. Thank you, Darren, and uh, thank you, um, the Aspen Institute, for honoring me today. I want to, Ursula, begin by just having you reflect, because your journey, the trajectory of a young girl from a working class background, raised in public housing on the Lower East Side of New York, you absolutely had some barriers and challenges to ascending to one of the great positions in corporate America. You were chairman and chief executive officer of the Xerox Corporation, the first African-American woman to lead a Fortune 500 company. I know that that journey was punctuated by many, many challenges and yet you prevailed and you 
were truly an outstanding leader for Xerox. So let's talk about uh, what it means to be a CEO, obviously as a woman, an African-American. Uh, just reflect on that for a bit. Yeah, uh, it's, a, it's a great question. It's one that I've spent the latter part of the past decade thinking about, you know, as I've transitioned out of Xerox and have been placed in more and more a position of, of the first, right, of the, this legacy leader who kind of paved the way for others. What I, what I realize now is that, you know, while I was going through my time at Xerox, I literally was just working. I was not thinking about legacy or not thinking a lot about me or, or even about Black people or Black women. What I was thinking more about was just getting the job done um, and getting the job done in a way that anyone broadly can be proud of the job that was that I did and that I could be proud of it as well. As I moved through and kind of got on close to the other side, I realized how big a deal this was not only for, for me and for Xerox, but also how big a deal it was for people who looked like me and some people who didn't look like me in presenting to the world um, the ability of people who look like me to be just a part of the tapestry of leadership. That's, and, and to be a good part of it. You know, I had, somebody told me when I was younger that I had three strikes against me. I was a girl, I was black, this is what they tell me. You're girl, you're black, and you're poor. And two of those things I can't change. And even if I could change them, I wouldn't. The poverty thing I would change in a minute, right? The thing that I had going for me was that I had an unbelievable foundation and set by this amazing woman, person who was my mother. I had an unbelievable and kind of varied support structure from all different places. Some places was the government when I needed it to get educational or funding support for my education from white male business leaders who gave me a shot here and there, or at least gave me visibility here and there from some of my best friends and mentors, people like Vernon Jordan, like Ken Chenault, like you, Darren, who said, ah, this is a person who is probably worthy of the time and energy to get a shot. So I happen to have a great foundation, but I had the, I think the best and most important asset that I had was the fact that other people around me said, ah, she's worth more, let's give her a shot. She's worth it. She, she's proven that she can do A, B, C. That means she may be able to very likely be able to do D, E, F, right? So I had this unbelievable uh, reservoir and wealth of people who looked at me and gave me a shot and gave me a break. I had the foundation of education, of hard work, of clarity of thought, of the ability to speak my mind, the bravery to speak my mind. I had that foundation to take advantage of the opportunities, but the combination of the two things were, were needed. So when I entered Xerox and started to run through the company, which was basically a whole lot of fun. There's a problem, there's a job, go do it. I say, okay, fine, I'll do that. I'll go do that, go do that, go do that. There was a point when somebody tapped me on the shoulder and said, no more, no more is this only for you and for Xerox. This is now a big deal. We're gonna, you're going to be on the public stage. So we have to ready you for that. We have to ready you to lead this company, to be a, a role model for our people broadly in Xerox, a role model for people who look like you and for people who don't look like you. So there was a point where it switched. And that point was when I started to really realize that all of this work that I had done up until this point, which I thought was just my job, was actually preparing me for, for something significantly more important than just leading a Fortune 500 company. So let's talk about corporate America and what has happened in the last couple of years. Certainly the murders in 2020, particularly George Floyd's murder, changed in many ways at least for a time, the conversation in the boardroom and the C-suite. Uh, we had for the first time, serious conversations about diversity, equity, inclusion. Give your assessment, Ursula, of progress. What I saw happen was people 
driven by some of it driven by their true hearts some of it driven because their constituents who their employees their communities wouldn't allow them to not react but we saw a reaction by corporate america that was one of hold on let me make sure i understand enough about what's going on so that i can think about contributing to the solution that's what we saw and we saw some companies some business leaders actually do more than just think about it, which is a big deal, by the way. Thinking about it is a big deal. But we saw people move beyond that. Even before they knew exactly what to do, they said, I'm gonna do something. So I'm going to give money to causes like Black Lives Matter. I'm going to um, give money to foundations that work in this space. I'm going to hire more aggressively uh, people of color. I'm going to fund businesses of, of people who, of color who, who start businesses, et cetera, et cetera. So we saw just everything kind of create a whole bunch of smoke and, and dust up in the air. Some of that dust has settled and turned out to be totally useless. But I think for the first time in my life, which is kind of long right now, I feel that we have reached a point where what all of the momentum that we saw after the killing of George Floyd is not there. So it's not as as aggressive as it was the day after that or the day of it but the momentum is still there and it's not going to be possible for corporate america to take the stance that it does oftentimes in these uncomfortable times which is let's just kind of lay low long enough and it'll go away one of the best things that has happened in the last couple of years is that business is no longer expected to be totally silent on issues that are of import to the world and to the future. We have to have a point of view. The place that this is a bigger, that's coming out bigger is in ESG, the environmental side, right? But that practice that we're getting in the environmental side is gonna spill over to how we effectively engage society as private businesses, you know, as non-governmental, agencies or non-governmental people, how we engage society from a power perspective, from an influence perspective, how do we do that for the good of the world versus for the good of me and of Xerox alone, all have to come together and figure out a way to lay the foundation for a better world. And it has to be done in partnership. So as we close Ursula Burns, I'd like you to share advice, advice to the next generation of CEOs. What skills, capability, uh, knowledge base, experience will they need to have in order to successfully lead and manage 21st century corporate America? The, one of the most important things about leadership is to define the reality and give hope. So you have to define the reality and define hope. What does good look like? What's the real situation we are? Then you can build a strategy to get from where you are to hope. So defining reality and giving hope is, is one of the most important um, attributes. Think about how difficult that is. Right? You have to understand enough about the today, but also have resilience, compassion, um, empathy to think about. And I don't mean that even that's even in business, right? All of those things, this, I, this grit to think about what good really looks like. I used to think it was things like how many hours could you possibly, you know, how I can, I can carry the weight. I can carry the weight. I, I think I've learned now at 63, I can definitely carry the weight. It's not enough. It's not enough. And by the way, it's more than not enough. That alone is a, is a formula for failure. This ability to see what the future can look like for your company, for the P&L of your company. It could be that basic, right? How successful, how efficient, how whatever the hell it is, you know, how much of a great supply chain. Understanding that and then building towards that, this completeness of and broad completeness of what good looks like, understanding that. So this idea of leading from an aspirational perspective is more in, is probably the most um, invigorating and eye-opening and value-creating perspective 
that a leader can have. One of the things I had to do before I became CEO was we had you know crisis of always financial crises and in, in, in companies that I happen to be engaged when I don't know if that's good or bad, but I had a financial crisis and and I had to one of the jobs was save two billion dollars. Figure out a way to save two billion dollars. And I remember at the, I wrote about this in my book. I said, you know, at the end of the day, I shouldn't, this is going to sound ridiculous, but I'm going to say, if all it was, was to save $2 billion, my daughter could have done that. She's, I mean, she looks at the, all of the things you spend money on and you start to cut it. Right? <laughs> Pretty straightforward. You say, well, we spend money on, on um, shoes. We're going to buy less shoes. We'll buy cheaper shoes. We're going to spend healthcare. We're going to buy less healthcare. Buy cheaper healthcare. We buy parts. We're going to buy less parts. But that's not. That's not what the, the goal wasn't to save two billion dollars. It was to make efficient, significantly more efficient, while delivering value, continuing to deliver more on more value, to fundamentally change the way that the business operated, that defined a new a new space to deliver, continue to deliver unbelievable value to our shareholders, to our customers, most importantly, to our communities and to our employees and do it for less. The for less part is what we spend most of the time on. The other things around it, the other check boxes that you have to be able to check to have true success is what the true leadership is about. It's about fitting it all together. Well, Ursula Burns, you certainly personify true, exemplary, excellent leadership. And I know everyone at the Aspen Institute is thrilled, delighted, and grateful to you as you accept their annual Corporate Leadership Award. Again, congratulations, Ursula Burns, on this great honor. Thank you so much, Darren Walker, and thank you, Aspen Institute. Thank you for joining us, and thank you once again to our honorees for their remarkable leadership. I also would like to express gratitude to all those supporters who made this program possible, especially those who supported us at the underwriter, sponsor, and chairman circles levels. They include Judy and Leonard Lauder, Carrie Walton Penner and Greg Penner, Jacqueline G and Miguel A. Bezos, The Crown Family, the Margot and Thomas Pritzker Family Foundation, the Laurie M. Tisch Illumination Fund, Bonnie and Kenneth L. Davis, and Melanie and Adam J. Lewis. Your commitment to the Aspen Institute allows us to do the work that's making a difference in the lives of people and communities every day, driving change through inclusive dialogue, values-based leadership, and solutions that matter. I hope you will consider supporting us by making a donation and we look forward to seeing you at one of our programs in the coming year. Thank you.